Hello, welcome to Minute Trails. My name's Stuart, and welcome to another Epic Battles Napoleonic Stroke Waterloo project vlog based around the range from World Games. Now, it's been a while since I did a little update on the project. It's been a busy summer for me, kids off and things, but I have been doing some little bits slowly in the background. But most of the epic painting I've been doing have been, <laughs> has been for other people as part of my work. So um, I'll cover that a little bit more at the end of the video and, and show you some pictures and things. But I have been slowly working on my own project along with all the other wargaming products I have being the typical wargaming butterfly. Now I've been spending a bit of time reading, I've been reading through the 100 Days Campaign Supplement which I reviewed on the um, channel a few weeks back now, probably more like a couple of months ago. Um, if you haven't checked out that, go and check out that now. It's quite a good review of the expansion, the first expansion to the Epic Battles Napoleonic rule set. Um, really focuses nicely around the 100 Days Campaign and gives us a lot more depth there's already quite a bit of depth in the in the standard rule book, but um, this really, really takes it to another level and introduces some things. Um, so I, I won't harp on about that here now. There's a there's a proper review on the on the on the channel already. So if you haven't seen it, it's well well worth going to have and watch that, even just so you can understand some of the things I refer to. But it, it got me thinking a little bit more about about unit frontage again, which has been a an ongoing question right back from the Epic Battles American Civil War release when these this size scale was first announced by Warlord Games. Um, they were widely applauded in many ways, but also one of the major criticisms was the amount of frontage that a four stand infantry battalion would, would give you. And then with the American Civil War, it was very easy just to reduce the number of stands because the number of formations required was a lot less. Um, and, I, and I simply reduced it as many other players did to a much, much more manageable state. So the five became four for large and the three became the standard rather than the standard four and so on and so on. With Napoleon, I think that was a little bit different. And I've talked about this a lot in previous vlogs, in fact, in great detail in many of the reviews and things. I really like the strips of 10. I really like the way they look and I understand what Warlord Games was trying to do in terms of a visual appeal. The, the idea of getting what looks like mass ranks of models. So in this case, a standard unit would be the four strips, so 80 actual models representing a battalion, which is something you don't really see very often in any scale, really. And then that was quite important to me. I didn't want to lose that, so I held off doing the splitting the strips that you see many people, but I've been thinking about it quite a lot recently. So new rules in the campaign supplement introduced um, some revised unit sizes, um, added tiny sized units, which you see in the standard black powder rules, but were missing from the kind of edited version that you, you use with the epic scale miniatures. And also there's some reference to larger units um, being five stands rather than the four. So. I've been thinking about that a little bit more as well and I've also read you know some other rules as you may have seen if you follow the channel I've done a review of the Soldier Napoleon rules which kind of uses stand as a way to show the size of the unit and it's an easy way to get around that if I play those rules and that's representing the number of stands or the relative unit strength via a, a dice mechanism um, and I've got a handy little command a unit with, with dice to do that and that can work in a certain way for black powder as well if, if needed. Um, but I didn't want to do that fully, um, but the, the frontage was the main thing. So I've gone and, and, and done what many people have done, which is split a stand. Um, and the reason I've done that is so I essentially I can work with what the, was the equivalent of a three stand unit and turn it into the full regiment. Now, I am not the first person to do that by any means. Many, many, many people have done it. Um, if you go to the Epic Battles Facebook group, the Waterloo one, the, ne the Napoleonic one that I set up, um, one of the fellow admins, Reese. if you go and, and, and flick through the, uh, the page there, you'll see that he's, he's done it right from the beginning. Um, and he's done something very similar to what I've done here. I think the major difference is his light um, troops their kind of semi-mixed order on that stand so that they can represent mixed order like that, um, and which is which is fantastic. And, and you could do that with this, and that's another one of the reasons for me doing it. While I have skirmisher stands, um, being able just to do that if I don't have enough 
skirmisher stands to represent it would be perfect. But essentially it doesn't matter, it's black powder. Um, and as long as your frontage is there or thereabouts the same as your opponent, or makes sense within the context of the game, then it doesn't really matter how you represent it, you could play it with, with that as your, as your unit size. But I wanted to do something that didn't take away what I like, which is that kind of look of mass troops. Um, but I didn't want to run just three normal stands because then you can't make formations like square very easy and it starts getting a little bit messy. And I do like the visuals. The visuals are probably the most important factors of the game for me. And now the easiest way to do it to only have to split one stand in many ways would be to split your command stand. Um, that way you could remove your non-specialist um, unit stand, your standard centre company stand, and work it that way and work with the two full strips with the flank companies on. The problem there being, if you do want to run different size units or you do want to remove a stand further, you're then losing one of your flank companies. I know the models rarely are barely different at this scale, so it doesn't matter that much, but it may do to some people. So what I decided to do was to split off the two stands that have the flank companies on, cut them in half, remove those sections and use those. So we've got our guards, our light, center companies and the, the center companies with stand um, and again this isn't showing anyone anything new you can create nice squares right. so if you march column do attack column easy enough or whatever representation you want to do it just gives you some flexibility as long as your opponent knows what you're doing it works well enough um, and then by keeping these um, and they will be useful for when I want to increase the size. So if I have a large, if I want to represent a larger regiment, I will probably just add in one of those. I could always add in two, but I'm not gonna paint up all of these spares I have. I'm gonna paint up a few of them um, with sort of generic different, well not generic, but different colored facings and things so that I can just slot them in to the particular unit that I want to represent as large. But in most cases, that's how I'm going to represent a, a unit I still plan on using a commander model for each unit um, to represent the colonel or something like that. And it's purely there just as a, as a in black powder, I suppose, as a knight's thing. Um, I probably won't use both dice, may, may use one to record um, rather than using casualty markers because I think at this scale, as much as I like the Warlord casualty markers, I have them for American Civil War, they're quite chunky. Um, and then to use them with the numbers on, um, they just take up an awful lot of space on the table. Um, and then to use them with a dial, it would look nice. But again, that's quite unobtrusive, a very small seven mil dice. We all have our own ways of doing it. There's no way it's better than the other. We just have our own preferences. So I'm gonna be using dice. I'll be using two dice when I'm playing Soldiers of Napoleon, because one dice will be representing the number, the size of the unit, which would be number of stands it would be as rules are written, rather than the number of stands I actually have represented here. Um, it looks quite cool behind the um, the models anyway, has no in-game use. Um, and then when I form square, he fits nicely in the center as well, which I also think looks pretty cool. So, so one change brings another, and I decided to rebase all of my skirmishes as well. So they were on um, the standard size base of the 60 by 20. Um, but I'd only put four miniatures on them rather than the six that uh, are shown in the pictures on the on the box art. Obviously you can put as many on as you want. I thought that looked more representative skirmishing anyway. Base beforehand would have been one strip like that. Um, for most games I'll probably still represent it like this just because it looks a little bit better. But I've got complete flexibility as I mentioned before. So I could just use one if I'm playing a large game and I'm trying to make the most of my um, figure connection. I can detach the light stand if I want to as well and do it like that, or even do it like that, uh, or even do it like that at a push. Um, but I do have the option to, to do it like that. And I think that looks pretty pretty cool, to be honest with you. And I'll just vary it about depending on what, you know, what scenario I'm playing at the time, who I'm playing against, what collection they have, what fits on the game table and which way around we're playing, etc. Now I'll come on to it a little bit later in the video, but I'm looking at scenarios around La Haye Saint still. Um, and there's some lovely new scenarios in the 100 Days campaign book, of which one of them, the defenders are all made up of small and tiny units. And um, I need to be using a lot of these. 
as a quick addendum to that section, um, these are the extra bases I'm using. I've picked up ones from Renedra, little plastic ones. The reason I've done that is, is they, they match the thickness um, and they have a slight beveled edge. Um, I ordered some MDF ones first, much like I did for the cavalry, with them having larger bases. And these just seem the better. And um, they're very, very similar price to MDF bases as well. So um, if you're looking to, to sort of do what I've done um, and you haven't started already, um, I would recommend these. I quite like the plastic bases rather than MDF where possible. So what do you need to split these strips? So really briefly, you definitely need a blade and a modeling knife. I use the scalpels with 10A blades on. So really cheap to buy in bulk. Set of clippers, potentially, obviously to get them off the sprue, definitely. A file I'd say was a definite. And then you've got the optional tidy up afterwards of a uh, sculpting tools and a little bit of green stuff. And then there's two things we want to look for. We want to look for obviously where you want to cut it down the middle. And there's two places to cut. You're going to be cutting here, and then you've got an option for this, this middle part, whether you want to cut it with a blade or whether you want to twist it. Now, I seem to have found the best results um, by copying other people, which is mostly just twisting and snapping. So I'll show you what we do. Make sure you've got the right place in the middle, cutting through the center of the sprue. And once that's fully cut all the way through, you can slowly twist and then he just snaps a half like that if you cut through it doesn't make a huge amount of difference um does leave you with a flat and neater cut um, but with this rougher cut um funny enough it seems to leave a little bit more of what you need sometimes so there's your two rough edges now you can just file away at these smooth off the edges and it does paint up fine to be honest with you and i'm not quite sure at what extent I'll go into using green stuff. I think it will depend on the miniatures. All of these strips are slightly different, or a lot of them are slightly different. So some of them have got quite nice big gaps. Some of them are really tightly shoulder to shoulder. So you may find you want to add a little bit back. You see this side is actually missing quite a lot of his arm there. From the side, it doesn't really matter too much, but a little bit of green stuff in there does go, goes a long way to make it tidy up a little bit. So that's the worst smoothed off, and this is the, the, the left-hand side of the strip, so the right arm of the model. And I think the most thing that's missing is the elbow and some of the, the top arm and the shoulder there. If you look at the side or the back, most of his cartridge box is there. So what you're really missing at the bottom there is just the, the edge of the trouser where it meets the, um, the top of the jacket. And you can actually add that back just by slightly gliding the blade and shaving a tiny bit off the leg and it just gives you a little bit of definition there for when you do paint in the edge of the jacket and you'll find that's all you need. So that bit I'm happy with. So it's just now, do we want to add a little bit of elbow and shoulder in? It works fine and when you don't and you just paint it, it absolutely looks fine, but let's add a little bit in. So I've got a little bit of green stuff here. I'm gonna apply it to the model and then break most of it off. I am no expert with green stuff and sculpting. I'm not a sculptor, but I can get around a little bit of thinning here. Now I've used a little bit of Vaseline or lick the end of your sculpting tool, stops it sticking quite as much, but just start to push it into place. You're just making a little sausage really here and then blending it in. Now I'm miles away from it, from my position where I'd normally be. My head is um, probably 18 inches away where it'd normally be a lot closer. I was doing some sculpting, but that's just the nature of having the camera half in the way. But a little bit of practice, and you can peel this off if you get it wrong. It comes off very easy. It takes ages to dry, but you get the idea. You can almost spend that long if you want, and that's better than just cutting it off. And how quick was that? So no problem at all. And what I'll do now is I'll pause the camera and I'm just going to have a slightly closer look, get my head a little bit closer rather than looking through the, past the camera or around the screen and see if there's any more little other tidy ups I could do. Now on the whole, I'm pretty happy with that. Didn't do much at all. If you do find you've got fingerprints in and things like that, and when you press down with the metal sculpting tools, it will depress the green stuff quite a lot. These 
clay shapers, these artist clay shapers, a lot softer, which means you can kind of drag them along and smooth out without actually putting too much of an indentation, indentation and you have to press a lot harder. It's always good to have a couple of those in your toolkit if you do. But let's move on to the other side. Now, this side is obviously the, the right hand side of the strip, but the left hand side of the model. Um, and some of them will be quite tight and they may shave off some of the gun or at least remove the definition from where your, your musket is and the shoulder is here. This again isn't too bad. I think there's enough musket down there anyway. You're missing a little bit maybe where the cuff is, so that might be a little bit messy. And some of them blend into the bread bag a little bit as well. So I'm not, I'm not gonna advocate cutting all your strips. It's purely a personal thing. If you think it's right for you, do it. I know a lot of people have split them all and use them for different gauge systems. Fantastic. I love the 10 man strip thing. I've cut the ones I've done as I've already mentioned for practicality for gaming reasons and I think having just the flank companies on separate strips at the end is a really nice sort of halfway solution to that. Next up I thought I'd give you a little bit of a, an update on where I'm heading with the Waterloo side of the project and in terms of the game planning. And those of you who watch from the beginning will know I like to plan my projects around some battles to start with in order to kind of have some focus around building collections. And my, my focus hasn't really changed, if I'm honest with you, but this book, The 100 Days Campaign, has um, given me some extra guidance for it, really. Um, it's been quite interesting reading the corresponding scenarios in the book and how they kind of fit around what I was planning on doing. And I hadn't written scenario, but I definitely planned out the regiments and the area of the battlefield. I don't know if you guys remember um, me sharing these maps so that was the overall battle um, map or at, at a given point. Um, and then I sort of factored in that area because I thought it gave me an area with La Haye Saint in and using that lovely model from um, Sarissa and, uh, and also a large part of Derlon's charge. Um, and it was going to be a very big battle to squeeze all on the one table. And I was struggling for space as it was anyway. It's one of the reasons for reducing the frontage. But or you know, if I'm honest, I was always going to struggle. And I want to play these games as much as possible on a 6x4. Because um, that's what I have. And that's just what makes, what makes sense, really. Um, that was it zoomed in before with the Hay Saint sort of in the, um, in the, in the bottom corner there. Um, but what's in the, the 100 Days campaign book just really really makes a lot more sense so we've got a nice little section of history there to start off so adrian walter who's written this book has given a nice little account of it which obviously can be found in loads of other places but it's lovely to have here um, and then he's broken it down into a couple of different scenarios which are really really cool um, and both of them looks like they're played on a six by four table but the the table is switched around the other way so it's focusing on the La Haye Saint and will work much better with the size of the terrain that I've got. So it's a true 15 mil from Sarissa. So it's quite chunky in many ways to have on a larger table, but works perfectly with the miniatures. So by doing it this way, it seems to make a lot more sense and it would be silly for me to continue to do it the other way. So I'll probably do a series of, of battles to do that area, focusing on La Haye Saint first and then Durland's attack afterwards. It's still covering what I plan to, but breaking it down. Um, so there's this great scenario here. I won't go through it in detail at the moment, so I won't read it all out. If you've got this book, go and have a read. Um, but it's, it's, there's some special rules, um, how to use some of the smaller um, units and things like that. And then you have your two order of battles. Um, but this may well be a much better way of playing this scenario. And I quite like the, the idea of playing it long ways on a six by four and making use of that nice bit of terrain. So that looked really, really good. Then you've got a second scenario as well, which is played the same way around, but it's the, the, the final assault. Um, and if you know your history, the, the French do take it. Um, the French have got enough, a much smaller um, order of battle here. So we're just talking about five um, battalions or five units and a tiny engineer unit. And then, then the Allied army is just tiny um, units. And there's even some a, a separate stat line for the defenders of the Haystain. And again, just looks like it would be really, really fun to play. Um, and I think I'll give it a go because I can crack out. I mean, I've got all of the Allied army painted already. Um, I'll just need to paint a couple more French um, battalions and finally find a use for those engineers. And it'll be a really fun thing to play. And maybe I'll film it and get it and get it on the channel. Um, and then you have, do have the full De Erlon's attack as well. And it looks like it's an eight by four. So I may have to do some um, trimming down. 
but there's some really key moments and this will be really really fun to do so I'll have a look at this um, and look at this order of battle and again many of the things that are covered in this order of battle are the the units that I'd identified from the the maps and the order of battles that I was working from so it'd be really really interesting to kind of cross-reference and work out whether there's any units I want to add in or take away and things but I think I'm going to use those three scenarios to be the core of the project going forward and it actually gives me something a little bit more focused to paint to and the final bit I wanted to show you today is I've been printing some MC miniatures um, and I printed off some of the British Peninsula line and I've pr printed a whole um, unit, a whole battalion in the, the new basing that I'm using, so the smaller flank companies. Um, I want to play with my print settings a little bit and the, um, the resin I'm using is fantastic, it's water washable stuff but it's quite brittle um, and with these really really small um, miniatures um, I'm, I keep accidentally breaking the tops of muskets off and things so I know there are some slightly more flexible resins out there so I want to do a little bit of testing on those um, so if anyone knows pop pop something in the comments for me if I recommend a resin but anyway I love the warlord stuff this isn't you know to replace those things um, it's just really nice that there are alternatives out there and 3d printing seems to be the way um, I'm still toying with the idea of um, cutting these up um, potentially using a using software and just taking the heads off but I might just physically do it um, and um, seeing if I can just swap the heads on some of the warlord models as well and how easy that is and how well it works because um, I do like the warlord sculpts I just really want these um, these stovepipe shackos to give that kind of you know peninsula feel but it gave me an opportunity to mess around with the the paint schemes and, and do some white and some brown and some gray trousers and uh, and I think it gives that kind of typical peninsula feel now that will be once I've painted up the the Waterloo stuff this will very much be my focus and probably a longer focus ongoing um, is to do more peninsula stuff because it's just my favorite period in history full stop um, and I'd love to spend a lot of time focusing on that well thank you very much for watching I'm just going to end the video now with some images of the stuff I have been painting but have to send off and give to someone else um, hopefully the client doesn't mind me putting them on the end of the video but I, at least I show I've been painting lots and lots of epic stuff just unfortunately none of it mine but it does look good all lined up on the table um, and it was really nice to see them all lined up and I took some short videos and, and pictures for the client so I thought I'd share them here as well um, the, con the progress continues I know the Waterloo stuff has, has been slightly quieter than than it has at the height and that's just natural when when a new thing launches and I'm reviewing lots of stuff that's coming out all the time the, the it, there's been an increase in video I know I had a couple of messages and comments from people asking when the next videos and things are coming out I will be continuing to do lots and lots of epic battles Waterloo stuff and there's even some American Civil War stuff coming back soon as well all the projects are rumbling on but this is a multi a multi-system channel lots of different historical projects so you will see other things on there as well which may not be for everyone's cup of tea but the Waterloo stuff will continue and I will continue to do the painting tutorials and things like that for you as well so the Wellington one has very recently gone up um, I have another few planned or half done um, and I'll just release them as and as and when the whim takes me now I do have requests for things but um, I have requests from from lots of different people for different things it's you know it might be four or five people request one thing four or five people request another and I'd love to do them all but just time gets away from me unfortunately um, work and work and family come first and, and this channel is is hobby rather than work even though it shares the same name as my business I will yeah I will paint the tutorials as and when the whim takes me when I have a little bit of time they obviously don't attract the same kind of of of, of numbers in terms of views and things anymore because people have, have got the hang of painting their own armies have already painted them or they've watched a couple of my tutorials and I honestly believe that's that's all you really need to work out how to use the same methods if you're following it for, for the others I know I've had a few requests for am I going to paint French Imperial Guard the foot ones we're talking about here and yes I will um, but when I do a tutorial I may do but they're so similar in technique and, and colors used to the standard French line that it's it, it's I'm not sure that many people would be interested in it so it will be as and when I'm 
you know really if i'm painting my own unit and i want to record a strip that's when i'll probably get around to doing it so it's just a case of of time really if i could be paid just to sit and paint um these all these units for you so there was a painting tutorial for every single different unit that, that warlord games have released for epic battles i'd love to it would be, be nothing more that would make me very happy but it's just a, a time and balance thing you know, really so please do continue to request things because if the same thing is is requested enough and enough and enough then i will definitely do it but it's just not unfortunately as simple as kind of being able to do them all because there was just too many releases now um the guard cavalry um stuff should be with me soon it may have you may have already seen a review on the channel um or it may come very soon after this video depending on um which which i have time to edit and get out first as i'm recording this my stuff is en route but hasn't arrived yet and i'm going away for the weekend so um, if it hasn't arrived in time this video may be out beforehand if you've already watched it or it's already out then uh, that you're watching this video afterwards um but in true Stuart style, it's got super rambly at the end. But um, thanks very much for continued support of the channel and watching the videos and the comments and things. Um, I'd love to hear all about what you're doing in your own projects. I, I see a lot of you share them in the Facebook group and things as well. So that's really, really cool. Um, I continue to ask questions. I'm happy to share with you how I may paint something if I haven't done a tutorial. I know I've had a couple of questions recently. People who have, have I think someone was asking about what color I'd paint the limber for the French um, artillery because I haven't done a, a tutorial for that and it's very easy to you know explain the way I do it um, and then you can paint the crew using the same methods it would be from the from the uh, inventory and so on and so on so that kind of stuff just ask the question I'm really really happy to help message me on Facebook through the miniature realms find me on Facebook personally I don't mind always happy to talk painting toy soldiers of any genre with people so please do get in touch anyway thanks very much for watching again take care I'll catch you soon